Welcome to Mosaic Church, and thank you for joining us here online. To prepare for today's message, we encourage you to utilize the Mosaic Cincinnati app. There, you can view the message notes, put in prayer requests, and so much more. Enjoy the message. It's my privilege to uh, minister this morning. Um, Pastor Joe asked me. I'm the basically the only dad he's ever had. And uh, I started on this father trip. Uh, it will be 58 years ago this coming September. Uh, and then from the time that daughter was born until Joe left for college was 32 solid years that we had kids in the house. And when he left for college, I celebrated. <laughs> and his mother cried. <laughs> you can understand the difference, I think. But uh, needless to say, we are very thankful for our pastor and our son. And uh, we, I would just as soon hear him preach this morning as me, because I think he does such a great job. In fact, uh, before I got up this morning, I had to take two sets of his notes out of my Bible so that I wouldn't get mixed up. I also am very thankful this morning that uh, children and youth are in here. Uh, you would be shocked at how many places I go to preach and uh, that numbers into the hundreds over the last few years uh, where I don't get to preach to the kids or I don't get to preach to the youth because they always have something else to do. So kids, I'm going to enjoy ministering to you this morning and I know you may think, well, he's too old to say anything I might wanna hear, but just listen, I might have something to say that, uh, that will urge you on to serve the Lord in a better way. I want you to turn your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Ephesians. It's a familiar verse. In fact, it's, uh, it's, I'm sure it's one of the first verses that uh, Joe uh, learned to quote when he was a youngster in junior Bible quiz many, many years ago. Uh, in Ephesians chapter six, verse one, Paul gives instructions. I want to just lay a little bit of the background for these instructions. The Christian church in Paul's day, the, church, the body of Christ in Paul's day, lived opposite the way the Roman government approved. So the, the Christian church was an anti-Roman government organization, not in its intent, but in the way the Romans viewed it. So what the Apostle Paul is going to tell us in Ephesians chapter 6 is that children have great value, which in the Roman government, children had no value. If a father didn't like his child, he could simply set his child out in the street and abandon him with no rep repercussions from the government. If a, if a father wanted, he could have his child murdered with no repercussion from the government. So what Paul is teaching here is the exact opposite of the way the people of the day ruled. And the same is true for in the teachings that he makes about marriage. Uh, in, 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 in Paul's day, in the Roman government, wives had no value in terms of human life. And a husband simply had to stand and proclaim that he divorced his wife and that was it. The wife had no way to come back, no court, no law to come back. So what Paul is teaching here is the absolute opposite of the way that the world operated in Paul's day. That's why we say that the church was the most revolutionary thing that ever happened for the family and for children. Because the, the, the believers in Jesus Christ taught a new way, a new means a new way to conduct yourself, a new way to relate in the home, a new value for the members of the household. And we thank God for that, that we can still stand here and proclaim, you, my friend, men, women, boys, girls, youth, you are all valuable in the sight of God. You have value in this church and you are a valuable part of this family of God that meets in this place. 
So let's turn to the Word of God and see what the Word of God would say. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. If you have a copy of the scripture, you'll note that this that these words are in quotation marks because they are quoting the Old Testament commandment, Ten Commandment number five. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. May God bless our understanding of his word this morning. In the book of Colossians, it writes it this way. And, and the, the same words, some of the same words are used and only used in the entire Bible in these two passages. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. This is the NIV. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. So however you read it, and from whatever translation you read it, it says a very similar thing. That children are to obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right, and Parents are to raise up their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It is God's plan. God's plan, God's word, has so much to offer you this morning. If you're a child, if you're a teen, if you're an adult or a senior adult, in fact, this word, this Bible is the best resource in the entire world for building a family. Now, why is that? Because the author of this Bible is the author of the whole idea of family. He is the one who created us male and female. He is the one who brought Eve to Adam. And do you know what Adam said when he saw Eve for the first time? Well, the King James Version puts it this way. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out a man. But though this is now bone and by bone, that exclamation that's right there in the Hebrew could mean, this is it. That's what he said when he first saw Eve. God arranged all of this, created all of this, made us male and female, made us with attractions that we have, made us to reproduce so that children would come. This is all God's plan and God's idea. So this is God's resource for building the family that God himself created. Wow. Today we're going to look at these instructions that God has given us in the New Testament because since he's the creator of it, he knows best how it should operate. And again, we may think that back in those Bible times, it was just so easy for people to do this. Oh no, they were bucking society the whole way. What Paul is teaching was anti-Roman government approved teaching. That's why they beheaded him in the end. Because the emperor hated him and hated what he was teaching. So we're going to tell you today how you should live. Even though what I'm going to tell you, some of what I'm going to tell you is not approved by the people, by the elites that seem to be in charge of the social welfare of our own country. Because I'm going to tell you what the scripture says and not what politicians tell you. And I'm telling you, it's different. So first of all, I want to talk to children. So, hey kids, listen up for a few moments. Number one, the Bible says in this passage, children, obey your parents. The word obey, obey is understood in the light of the instructions that God gives to your parents just down the way in verse number four. So he tells you to obey, but he tells you to obey in the light of what your parents are supposed to be doing to you. That is, parents will not discipline you out of anger. Parents will not use discipline and instruction that comes from the world, but they'll use the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. 
So what God's telling you is based on what he's telling your parents. However, you need to learn to obey God in the midst of hard circumstances. So sometimes your parents do punish you in anger. But you have to say, I'll obey God, not man. I'll do what God says, not what man does. And I'll make room for some people, even my parents, to sometimes blow it. Because if you're a parent here, you know you have blown it from time to time. And sometimes in a way you wish you could take back many times over. The second thing it says that children are to obey their parents because they and their parents belong to the Lord. The youngest one on this platform serves the same Jesus that you and I serve as adults. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's no different in the heart of a child. When I was an eight-year-old boy, my dad stood in a pulpit, not like this. It was an old country church. And in front of the pulpit in that old country church, there was a 1995 rug that came from Woolworths. For you who don't know what that was, it's the precursor to Walmart. And on that 1995 rug, there was a wooden bench that we called an altar bench or a mourner's bench. And my dad preached, I was only eight, my dad preached a Sunday night sermon from Isaiah chapter 53. I was the only convert that night. But I found out that the Jesus that was in the heart of my dad came into my heart. And his Jesus became my Jesus. And we've worshiped together. We worshiped together until my dad was killed in a car wreck in 1970. I was only 23 years old at the time. It's amazing how I've continued to worship the, the God of my fathers. And he, my dad, was led to the Lord by the person who became his father-in-law later. The preacher was actually my grandpa on my mom's side that led my dad to the Lord. And then you're hearing the fourth generation of this continuation of preachers that have come. And it's the same Jesus through generations and time. So children, obey your parents in the Lord because your parents worship the same Jesus you worship. And you worship the same Jesus that they worship. And both you and your parents have such great value in the sight of God. For God sent his only begotten son for the youngest one in this room and for the oldest one in this room, thank the Lord. <laughs> and both parents and children must commit to, to serve the Lord. And then the third thing it says, children obey your parents in the Lord because it is the right thing to do. In other words, obedience will bring the right result. Here the Apostle Paul refers back to the Ten Commandments. Commandment number five, honor your father and mother, then you will live a long life, a long full life in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. That's Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 12. One commentator writes it this way, the promise for those who obey their parents is that they enjoy a prosperous and long life on earth. This states a general principle that obedience fosters self-discipline, which in turn brings stability and longevity in, in one's life. So the scripture saying obey the Lord, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the earth. So I ask the question, then, how do I translate this into a lifestyle for you and for me? Obedience means living within the protective wall that God has built around us. You realize that when you go through the, through the um, aquarium that's over in Newport, when you walk through that aquarium, and those walls of glass are on both sides of you, both sides of you. That you are the one that's free, and the ones that are in the fish that are in the walls of glass, the piranhas that are in the walls of glass, are in captive. You do realize that. The commandments of the Lord form a wall about us in which we can walk in freedom. And on the other side of the wall are those deviants, that those devils that want to take us and enslave us with their devices. 
So as long as we're within the wall, walls of the Ten Commandments, we have the freedom to walk in the way that God wants us to walk. But when we, out of our ignorance, or sometimes out of our obstinance, or sometimes out of the intentions of an evil heart, when we break through one of those walls and get on the other side of it, we open ourselves up to be possessed by that which is on the other side of the wall, and we lose our freedom. I've heard Celebrate Recovery people put it this way. You may reach out and voluntarily take a hold of the bottle the first time. And you may do it again voluntarily the second time. But at some point, the bottle takes hold of you. And you're a captive, a slave. And that's indicative of any other kind of sin you could put in the place of the bottle anything else that you could do where you think you're reaching through to freedom, but in reality, you're reaching through to bondage. So the scripture says you live in obedience to God's word and there's a hedge about you that protects you because you're walking in the freedom of the Lord, free from the devices of the enemy. Obedience means living according to God's word. And if you live in God's word, it will guide you and lead you away from evil and into righteous living. So now let me talk to the fathers for a moment. Paul calls on fathers. He says to you, dad, take responsibility. Be the source of love for your home. In Ephesians 5.25 And Colossians 3.19, husbands are instructed in both places with a command word. And the command is, husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, love your wives. I want to tell you something you may not know. There's not one place in the New Testament of this Bible, and I hold a very fine one in my hand that's been as a gift from one of the fellows I've helped along the way. There's not one command word used in this Bible to tell wives to love their husbands. Now, there is a verse that says that Husband, that wives are loving their husbands, but not in the form of a command. You understand what a command is. It's a direct word that says you do this. The command is for the husband to be the source of love in the home. Now, husband, love your wives. Let me explain that. There is a word, there is a word in the Greek that you sometimes hear transliterate, transliterated into English, agape. In the Greek, the verb is agapao. And it is a command word, but the word agape is a certain kind of love that means self-sacrificial, self-giving love. And it's used like this in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's that word. It's the same word used for loving your wives. So in the same way that God loved us and gave his son to die for us, In that same kind of self-sacrificial, self-giving attitude, we turn our love toward our wives and give our lives to serve them. And it's command of God. It's it's an instruction, instruction that comes from the very word of God. Love your wives as Christ also loved the church with self-sacrificial, self-giving love. Again, this is the exact opposite of the way the people lived in Paul's day. In Paul's day, children and wives had no rights. Cruelty was woven into society. Human life, such as that of an unwanted child, had no value. But Paul instructed Christian men to be different. And to be the source of love, not the source of hate in their home, but the source of love, not the source of violence but the source of love. Not the source of anger, but the source of love. Not the source of abuse, but the source of love. Husbands, love your wives. And then the scripture says, 
While you're loving your wife and children, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. And the word is used here that we would translate into English, exasperate. Everybody in here knows what it feels like to be exasperated because you've been to the license. <laughs> you, you've sat in the waiting room at the emergency room for five hours. You, I mean, you know, you, know, you know how it feels to be exasperated. One writer puts it this way, fathers are addressed because they represent the governmental head of the family on whom rests the responsibility of child discipline. Fathers are not to exasperate, meaning provoke to anger. This word is used only here and in Romans 10, 19 and Colossians 3, 21, only three times in the entire scripture talking about treating children with unreasonable demands or petty rules or favoritism or in a way that simply takes the joy out of their living. Simply, simply put, it's this. Fathers, don't cause your children to be discouraged. Instead, three things are said. Bring them up, rear them, nourish them, bring them up, and provide for their spiritual, emotional, and physical needs. Two, Train them, train them, including directing and correcting them. Train them, and three, instruct them, teach them everything you know. And the truth is they're going to learn more than you teach them because they'll have other, other sources for learning. But guide them and direct them and instruct them in the ways of the Lord because he's to be the center of their relationships and of their teaching and learning. Just a word of advice, dads. Don't, don't believe the unbiblical advice that society tries to give to you. There's a pastor out in Washington named Jesse Bradley. And in a recent interview, in talking about why American fathers need to re reject three damaging lies in today's culture, he gave these three words of encouragement. And I'm going to urge you because what I'm about to tell you are lies in today's culture. Lie number one. You cannot be a good dad. That's a lie. That phrase tells me that you're defeated before you start, so don't even try. But don't you believe it. If you adopt the attitude of the Apostle Paul, even in working with your children, you can be a better dad than you ever thought. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that means, yes, you can be a good dad. You might have a you might have faults and failures in your past, but you can simply say, with God's help, I'm going to nourish my children. I'm going to treat my children with godly respect and love. I'm going to bring my children up in a godly way in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I can do it because the Spirit of God is going to help me do it. Lie number two that we're told these days that is that it's fine to be an independent dad. Just go off somewhere and be a dad and you know, pop in and out of your children's lives, but don't be bound down by them. No, you, you, you can't do that and be a good biblical dad. Don't run off from the responsibilities of your home and family. Don't forsake the responsibilities that you have to the children that you helped bring into the world. God intends for you to be a present help in that child's life to, to the best of your ability and as much as you can. Some of you might be restricted and unable to, unable to by time or distance, but God intends for you to put your heart into it and be all you can be. Lie number three is this. Being a father is not important. Now, indeed, your child may have wonderful teachers at the school that they attend. And those teachers can become very respected by your children. I've been in education from the time I went into grade one until I got my last degree. I was in for more years than I can count with all the different stops. But I, and I have a lot of teachers I really respect. When I did my master's level degree back in seminary years ago, I did almost half my classes with one with one instructor, he became my, the professor of my life. Melvin Hodges was his name. And I, I grew to respect him, not more than my dad, but right up there, I mean, right with, with the greatest men of my life. I will tell you this, I will tell you this, that even though 
I've had wonderful instructors and teachers through my life. I still look back to what my dad taught me in the short 23 years I had him before he went to heaven. And you, my friend, as a father, have a primary responsibility, not a secondary responsibility, but a primary responsibility to teach you. Your child needs you. And they need you, Dad, to teach them to fill that spot that God has ordained that you should fill in their lives. Amen? But I want to make one more application of this verse. I want to talk to all the men in this crowd. And I consider men, since I'm including my oldest grandson that's here in this room right now, I consider men to be guys that are 18 and over. So Jason, you just got included. Act like it now. (laughs) He does. I want to talk to you as church fathers, whether you have biological children here in this church or not, you're a church father. The children who attend Mosaic need godly men to demonstrate the love of God to them. Some children will come to church without a father in their home. Some will come never even knowing their biological father. Children need to experience the love of God through the touch of a godly, earthly human being, a father or a father figure. So men, listen to me for a moment. I urge you, I'm going to tell you something that I think Jolie could tell you if she was up here and willing to talk to you like I'm talking to you right now, pretty straight men. Here's what I urge you to do. Go to your children's pastor and volunteer for one Sunday a month to work back in children's church. Even in the nursery. Even if all you can do is sit in a rocking chair back in that nursery and rock crying babies as a father. Now, we'll vet you and make sure you're okay before we let you in there. (laughs) Go and volunteer. Volunteer for youth on Wednesday night. Become a part of some children's life. Just give up one Sunday a month where you minister to kids as a a father, as a a 40 or 50-year-old guy. You'll find such great blessings. When, when Joe was a, he was not even a year old, we, we became pastors of the church in Columbia, Missouri, where he grew up all through high school, and we lived there until he, was a, until he was married already, so his whole life he spent there. But when we took that church, there was a man in the church who had recently retired from being a postal delivery man. His name was Virgil. Virgil was about 25 plus years older than I am, and and, uh, and maybe more than that, maybe a little bit more than that, but he was like a godly father. And he, he did just what I'm saying. At 70 years old, he would go back in the nursery and rock babies one, one Sunday a month. And he would do a lot of other stuff. He had a pickup truck and he was single. He was, uh, he, he was a widower. And every single lady in the church had him help them move with his pickup truck at least once. He was known for that. And he was just a great guy. He used to tell me, he said, he said, Pastor, I'm going to live to be 100 so that I can see what you look like when you're 75. (laughs) Virgil, and I'll never forget pictures of him as an old guy sitting back in our nursery just rocking babies, trying to be a godly influence, even on children in the nursery. So men, I urge you, I urge you. I ask you to do this, men. Men, I'm asking you. I'm asking you to learn the names of some of the kids that were on this platform. Now, I know when you get my age, you almost got to write it down. I mean, if you go in one ear and out the other. I did meet Kingsley, Kinsley this morning, and I didn't forget her name, at least till now. <laughs> I'm going to try to remember it. So set yourselves to, to learn the names of some of these kids. And as you wander out in this big foyer after service, get to where you can walk up to someone and say, hey, Jason. I mean, just, just get to you. I mean, they'll, they'll think, he knows my name. How did he find out my name? I tell you how I found out some of your names. My wife writes things down, so I'll bump her and say, who's that? <laughs> and she'll, she'll tell me. 
learn some names. Men, you'll, you just don't, you, you won't have any idea of the impact you'll have if you'll just reach out and begin to love on the children that are not even your children, but they are your children because you belong to this family. And we share. Why do I urge you to do this? Because I have a history. I've had the blessing of being raised by a godly father and mother. I can tell you if my mom was here with her four inch heels on, I would still have to look up a little bit to see her eyeball to eyeball. And she had a index finger, mine's all crooked now as you can see, but she had one that was about four feet long. (laughs) And you think I'm loud? You should have met, my mom had a voice. Well, I was raised by this godly father and mother But I was also blessed growing up in church from the day I was 10 days old until now, attending as many Sundays as I ever could and feeling terribly guilty if I missed a Sunday morning service. I've been blessed by godly men in the churches my dad pastored and even in the churches that I pastored. Godly men when I was a little boy taught me how to ride a horse. My dad, my dad was a disabled veteran and although he didn't take disability till I was a sophomore in high school, he was, he was never completely fully healthy because of the injuries that sustained in World War II. So a godly man in my church took me out to his farm, saddled a horse for me and taught me how to ride it. When I was, I was such a little kid, my, my feet barely touched the stirrups, but it gave me a love for horses. And even when Joe was a teenager in high school, we had a horse for him to ride. He rarely rode it, but he had it. <laughs> Sometimes dads want something more than their kids want something, you know. (laughs) Godly men in our church taught me how to hop on a tractor and plow a field. My dad never even owned a tractor. Godly men in our church taught me how to hunt swamp rabbits. Now that's totally above you. You don't, if you've not lived in the swamps like where I was raised, you've never done that. Swamp rabbits don't have a cottontail, by the way. And they're so long that if you hook a stick through the back leg of one after you shoot it and then put the stick through your belt loops, you'll drag the head off the rabbit before the day's over, if you're a boy. Godly men taught me how to do that. Some of you don't think that's very godly, but they did. (laughs) Godly men taught me how to load watermelons out of a field and how to stack hay bales in a barn. They taught me how to do all kinds of things that I would have never learned on my own. But they also taught me this. Godly men taught me how to get on my knees, how to pray. I listened to godly men pray. Remember back when we had church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night? And in our church tradition, many of our services would end with altar time. And many a time I would just sit and listen because godly men would pray all about me. I learned how to pray by listening to godly men pray out loud. I learned how to sing, sing from the inside, my insides out of the depths of my heart by listening to godly men. One of them died just a few weeks ago, 90 some years old over in Paducah, Kentucky. I watched him as a boy and I was mesmerized by the low notes that he could hit and the way he could somehow sing with a smile on his face. And the way his beautiful wife would play the piano, seeming like her fingers would never even touch the keys, but you'd hear the sound, the way they floated over the keys. And I saw that and thought, if I could only do that, I had godly mentors and godly people that told me that all within the body of Christ that, that, that was around me all the time. So I'm talking to you from experience. The impact you can have on these children, men, the impact you can have is above what you can even think. I urge you to do it. Please, men, dedicate yourselves to the spiritual and physical well-being of the boys and girls in this church. Now let me apply my message just shortly. I know I'm, I know I'm past time, but I'm old and I couldn't read the clock very well. And, I'm going to ask, listen to me, I'm going to ask all the children 
18 and under, teens and children, to stand up right now. Just stand right where you are. You don't have to move out of your seat. Just stand. Thank you so much, kids, for standing so quickly. I'm going to read an adaptation of my text, and I'm going to have you repeat after me. Will you do that? Just repeat what I say, but mean it from your heart, out loud so we can hear you. With God's help, I will obey and honor my parents in the way the Lord has commanded, for it is the right thing to do. And I know that God is pleased when I do this. Thank you. Let's give our kids a big hand this morning. Thank you. You can be seated. Now I'm going to ask all the fathers to stand. If you're a father, would you please stand? And if you're a father, expectant father, feel free to stand with us. <clears throat> please repeat after me and out loud so the kids can hear you. I will make every effort to raise my children, parentheses, and grandchildren in the training and instruction of the Lord. And I will be careful not to exasperate, embitter, or discourage them in the process. I will be there for them to encourage and cheer them on in all their pursuits. Now remain standing, but let's give our dads a big hand this morning. Okay, all the men in the room, 18 and above, stand. All the men stand. And the boys, 18 and above, young men, all the men stand. You're our church fathers. Some of you are young, but you're coming, you're coming up. Blink twice and you'll be my age. No, <laughs> not quite. All the men in the room, I want you to repeat after me. We, the men of Mosaic Church, will make every effort to show the love of Jesus to the children and youth in this church family. We pledge ourselves to be godly examples before them and show them the way to live as believers in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Will you do it? Let's all stand. Thank you so much for joining us for today's message. We look forward to having you back next week.